Happy Pride Month! Queen's Public Library continues its ongoing commitment to promote queer liberation and representation across our borough and beyond. We will be highlighting LGBTQ plus titles, including banned books, sharing knowledge and stories through our programming, and so much more. Everyone is welcome at Queen's Public Library, and we are here for you. For more information, visit queenslib.org forward slash pride 22. Summer reading kicks off this month. Visit summerreading.queenslibrary.org for our full summer reading program schedule, book lists for all ages, and other resources to keep your kids engaged and learning all summer long. Juneteenth celebrates the end of slavery in the United States. Check out our reading lists and join us for in-person and virtual programs to learn more about this important day in U.S. history. Visit our website for more information. The best way to fight book banning is to read banned books. We are joining forces with Brooklyn Public Library and the New York Public Library to take a stand against censorship with the NYC Banned Books Challenge. 10 banned or challenged books that expert librarians recommend New Yorkers borrow and read. Visit our website for, to learn more. Welcome to Queens Public Library's talk with Gall Beckerman, author of The Quiet Before, on the unexpected origins of radical ideas. The New York Times writes, its title, notwithstanding, The Quiet Before crackles with noise. It is elegantly argued and exuberantly narrated, often brilliant. The Economist states, engaging, not a treatise or big picture history, open-minded and curious, it suggests rather than argues and never shouts. Those are virtues easy to overlook, like Beckerman's chosen radicals as they incubated in obscurity. Susan Orlean, author of The Orchid Thief and On Animals asserts, the moment for this book is now, as we navigate this new era of virtual interactions and wonder how we got here and where we're headed. Hi, I'm Brian Alessandro. For those of you who don't know me, I have written for Interview Magazine, Newsday, Pank, Huffington Post, and have recently adapted Edmund White's A Boy's Own Story into a graphic novel for Top Shelf Productions, Penguin Random House, which will be released this November. Additionally, I co-edited Fever Spores, The Queer Reclamation of William S. Burroughs, an anthology of essays and interviews about Burroughs, which was just released this past week. I'm also the co-founder and editor-in-chief of the literary journal, The New Engagement. My first novel, The Unmentionable Mon, was published in 2015 by Karen Press, and my first feature film, Afghan Hound, was produced by Marie Media in 2011 and is now streaming on Plex TV and soon on Mubi. Culture Connection, curated by Daniel Zaleski and now in its ninth year at the Queens Public Library, is proud to present international artists from emerging talent to award-winning masters. These disciplines include music, theater, author talks, and film. Now expanding into a virtual format, Culture Connection is currently reaching a global audience. Gold Beckerman is a former writer and editor at the New York Times Book Review and the current senior editor at The Atlantic. He's also the author of When They Come For Us Will Be Gone. He holds a PhD in media studies at Columbia University and writes for many publications, including The New Republic and The Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Gall. Your book is so fascinating and exceedingly well written. Oh, thank you, Brian. I'm I'm thrilled to be here. This is a this is a hometown event for me. Uh, <laughs> it is. You're originally well. You're originally from California, but you've yeah. been based in New York for a while. But now yeah. you're in California again. <laughs> My Angelino relatives are going to to you know yank me with a you know, <laughs> off of here. No, I did. I'm, I'm from Los Angeles originally, but I've lived in in New York most of my adult life in, in Brooklyn. Fantastic. Um, I'd like to read the first paragraph of the introduction, if you don't mind, before we begin. Um, <clears throat> change. 
The kind that topples social norms and uproots orthodoxies happens slowly at first. People don't just cut off the king's head. For years and even decades, they gossip about him, imagining, imagine him naked and ridiculous, demote him from deity to fallible mortal with a head which can be cut. This is true for revolutions of all sorts. Slavery exists, and then a small group of people begin worrying about themselves and the moral blight of humans owning other humans, weighing what might be done. Their talking transforms them into a group with purpose, with a purpose, abolition, and discussion eventually bubbles up into action and then into the changing of minds and eventually laws. It's a really riveting way to start your book, which as I said earlier, is so much about people, uh, people's ideas, people talking, coming together, community. Ideas aren't just born out of nowhere. It's about human interaction. And, and your story captures those narratives beautifully. How long did it take you to write The Quiet Before? And what was your process? And please talk about how much it consumed you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, there's not, I don't actually have like an easy answer to that, to that question. I can say that the, the, the idea sort of at the center of it, which is to, to do a book that looked at the role of communication in the birth of new ideas, uh, radical ideas, political, social change, and sort of how it starts among conversation, uh, that has been sort of percolating for almost 10 years uh, before the book actually saw wow. the day. Um, and in the course of those 10 years, I sort of realized that I needed uh, an education in some sort of media history to really understand how other people have thought about this question. And so I went and got a PhD, um, okay. which, which, uh, which slowed the process down considerably, but also allowed me to learn a whole bunch of stuff that then I then tried to throw out entirely uh, when I when I went to write the book. Because as you said, I was really intent on this book being a sequence of stories and um, stories informed by, by some of that theory, um, particularly sort of the mid-century, you know, media, media studies uh, greats, you know, like Marshall McLuhan and others. Yeah. Um, but, but I didn't want that to be the way that readers approach the material. I really wanted to, as you, as you put it so well, sort of um, create an encounter between the reader and these individuals, you know, and, and, and really at that sort of basic level. You also wrote in the acknowledgement section that at one point uh, your wife joked that your book became like the third person in the marriage, uh, that it was consuming you so much. That that was the, the part of the question that I was. I mean, yeah, yeah, about. No, it's true, and that yeah. and that does happen with these projects, sure, you know. And, sure. um, and it's hard because I and this is maybe getting into too personal territory, but like, but I, I like I, you know, I struggle with this because it's it's I I can't take on something like this without it becoming an obsession. I yeah. feel like. Like it's it's sort of the way that um, it, it really gives me a lot of meaning, you know, to have a project like this, even when it's hard, you know, even when you're and then this book, you know, because each of these chapters and we'll get into it a bit is is kind of these self-contained worlds. It was an enormous amount of historical research, archival, sometimes reporting that I had to do for each one just to sort of understand the basis of, you know, the basic, you know, aspects of what I was writing about, you know, sure. whether it was, uh, you know, 17th century France or, uh, or Ghana, you know, pre-revolution, pre-independence Ghana, or, you know, you know, zines and riot girl in the nineties, each one of these was a whole world that I had to kind of understand. Uh, and my wife's argument was that I had not, was not writing one book, but writing like 10 books, you know, <laughs> because, because by the time, you know, you'd sort of start at the bottom of a mountain, climb all the way uh -huh. to the top, be able to say something about it with confidence, and then you're back at the bottom of the mountain again for the next chapter. Yeah, I get it. I get it all too well. So let me see if I understand this correctly. The the germ of the idea actually occurred to you before you got your doctorate, and that's what led you into the program? Yeah, that's right. Wow. I, had, I had written an earlier book um, that was sort of a, a history of, a, of one particular social movement. Um, uh, involving dissidents in the Soviet Union. We can get into that too. Um, but uh, for the next book, I sort of, as I began to, to, uh, you know, to tackle how to do this particular project, because the idea of the things that I knew from the beginning was that I wanted to tell a, a story that went back historically and all in, in, and led it its way up to the present. And that would be done in a series of stories mm -hmm. that, and that the reader's job would be sort of to, 
to start to connect the dots as they move from one story to another, which is sort of an unusual structure, but it's something that I that I wanted to do. Um, and in order to sort of make sure that I felt solid about the big idea, I began to, to read a lot of sort of media theory. Um, and it drew me into sort of an academic, you know, a sense that, oh, maybe this could be a very helpful way of, of, of understanding of approaching this particular project. And I mean, I have to say, I keep saying the approach is actually really exhilarating. And I love these kinds of books that make these sort of connections that I think conventional thinkers wouldn't necessarily make. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. What is the common den denominator of all major social movements? How do they all start? Is there a central common denominator? Well, the thing that I found and that then sort of lent itself to you know, my, the big idea of this book, you know, it, it can be captured in the title, you know, the notion of a quiet before, that what I came to understand is that the successful social movements of the past and of the present too, all shared in common that they began in small ways, uh, you know, around people whispering together, you know, uh, or sitting around a table. Um, that sounds like a fairly banal, um, you know, observation, but actually, you know, I think that it was exciting to me to to explore this simply because we've lost so much of that, those sort of quiet spaces. And we believe that the sort of big protest in the street is the thing that, that matters. And then when I began to look through all of this history, I discovered that, you know, even in mediated ways, so I'm not, I'm not talking about when, you know, people were in cafes necessarily or sitting around literal tables, but that there were forms of communication, things like letters, you know, that allowed people a chance to actually engage in a more sort of um, discursive form uh, that, that, that gave them a chance to go back and forth, to debate with one another, to egg each other on, to refine ideas, to imagine together without fear or shame, you know, about what they were saying. So all of that, 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 that sort of, you know, what I call sort of the quiet secluded space, you know, um, is so, seemed almost universally important, you know, when you look at any of these movements. Almost like a spontaneous think tank, you know, happening in a living room or in a basement yeah. or a cafe. Yeah. Can you tell us a little more, and I think this gets to the point, is the incubation of radical ideas mm -hmm. in this, uh, particularly um, the third act as posited yeah. by Saul Alinsky and Rules for Radicals, which mm -hmm. was published in the late 1960s. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I kind of, I use this word incubation. I don't love the word incubation because I feel like um, Silicon Valley has sort of taken it recently and, and, and made it sound like, you know, what you do when you want to have a startup, you know, you incubate. Um, but actually, it, it, I kept coming back to it as the most perfect sort of word to describe what I'm looking for, which is, you know, incubation is something that is a slow process. It demands a lot of heat and closeness and, um, you know, physical incubation, you know, is it, we think about in those terms. Um, but ideas, radical ideas, ideas that have never existed in the world say that, you know, people should be universally free, you know, that there shouldn't be slavery or that women should have the right to vote um, or that we should you know, to bring it to our present day should take enormous risks, you know, to to end climate change, you know, or the problems of climate change. Those sorts of radical ideas need that sort of incubation space. Now, Solinsky, who you mentioned, I, it was another great metaphor, you know, that I came across um, that he provided uh, in addition to incubation, which is he talked about revolutions, successful revolutions as being uh, the culmination of three acts. He said there's always he's like, you know, when you look throughout history, there's always three acts to, you know, like like a three act play. You know, uh, in the first act, you meet the protagonist and the antagonist and they sort of define uh, their opposition to each other. In the second act, the tension increases between the two of them and you begin to know sort of where the lines of battle are going to be drawn. And the third act is this moment of, you know, one defeating the other, hopefully good defeating evil, and this kind of revelation, you know, of, of the world sort of changed. Um, and what Alinsky, uh, what Alinsky, who's, you know, been influential for many, for, for people across the, the political spectrum, I mean, there's, I found in, actually in the course of writing this book, there's white supremacists to read oh Saul yeah, wow. no, they're very, you know, he's Jewish, so they do it, you know, sort of holding their nose, but they but they do read him because they feel like he has something important to say about community organizing, right. about how you actually like build something sure. on the ground up. Solinsky was worried, even when he was looking at the, you know, when he was writing at the end of the 60s, beginning in the 70s, when when mass protests became the sort of one and the, the kind of major tool that was being used by by activists. 
to him, it indicated a kind of leaping over those first two stages that, that, that what I call incubation, when he's calling these first two acts of a play that need to happen, he thought that, that these activists were rushing too quickly to that last act, to the revelation, to the good defeating evil. And in doing so, they were sort of shortchanging themselves, you know, or, a, you know, getting a good feeling, you know, like that they were actually achieving something, but what they were achieving was sort of at the emotional level and not really, uh, a changing of laws or whatever else that they want to, you know, stopping of war, whatever the thing is that they wanted to actually, sure. you know, make happen. Um, Gold, Gold, in the last decade alone, we've witnessed several high profile movements gain major traction through social media in particular, like Arab Spring and hashtag Me Too, Black Lives Matter. Is social media where the movements now all start? We've lost that physical intimate space. Are we now transposing that? intimate space into cyberspace is that what's happening here i mean i i think so i mean i think i think social media has become our sort of de facto um public sphere and that's the thing that scares me you know because because i think that um and i can i can I can speak positively about social media too but this is you know that but and i don't like want to throw it out entirely um mm -hmm. but i think that as we've all come to realize in our personal lives that there is a certain sort of dynamic that takes over when people interact, when they communicate on these platforms. The platforms want you to be sort of performative. They want you to be sort of attention grabbing. They move fast. They're distracted. You know, they're, they're, there's not a lot of focus to them. Um, and so they mold the kind of speech that can happen there, the kind of discourse, the kind of conversation that can occur there. Um, and I think it has wider implications for all of society like that what I call that kind of social media metabolism has taken over so many different realms. I mean, think about our politics. I mean, Donald Trump was a uniquely social media produced politician, yeah. you know, uh, in that he understood that uh, dynamic. He understood sort of how social, what social media wants and how to give it. Uh, and so I worry if that is our public sphere, what it's doing to our social movements, that it's sort of making them a little bit too not a little bit, but a lot focused on these sort of grand attention grabbing, emotionally satisfying moments uh, of release um, and, and, and sort of distracting people from the hard work that needs to happen uh, to actually make change. I think it's sort of a pity maybe because I have a friend who's an activist and she's been very active uh, as an activist since the early 90s and she still is. And she said, God, I remember a time before the internet, it was just so laborious to try to communicate yeah. with one another and organize. But with social media, it's easy to you know, send a message to so many people. But to your point, it's also a double-edged sword because it's such a shame that it's extinguishing our attention spans <laughs> to do the tedious, mundane, long-term work. And, and it's not, I want to just add, it's not just that. I think the tedious mundane work feels tedious and mundane, but it actually is doing, playing a really important role in terms of strengthening a movement. And there's actually a great uh, sociologist named Zainab Tufekci who wrote a book a few years ago called From Twitter to Tear Gas. And I sort of I took this idea a bit from her because she posited that, you know, because movements can go from zero to 60, right? You don't have to. You don't have to sit there and work the mimeograph machine or like go door to door or have the thousand church basement meetings to organize your protest. You just send out a tweet and everybody shows up, right? So on one level, yes, that's great. I mean, in human history, we've never had such a device like that, you know, that can, such a tool like that. But she argues that what it, what it does away with is the building of what she calls the internalities. It's a slightly academic word, but it means like, you know, where is the kind of solidarity and the sense of sort of built, um, you know, uh, resilience that that, that, that 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 needs to be baked into a movement to withstand the hard times, to figure out, to, to be flexible in terms of strategy and tactics and all of that, you know, is a is it can be seen as sort of an outgrowth of the hard work of the hours put in of the sweat. You know, it's 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 something that is a side effect of doing all of that because you're just with people constantly doing the small things and it, allow, it helps you do the big things later. Yeah. My next question is a little bit long winded and I think it sort of synthesizes your answer a little bit and then introduces maybe another one. So just bear with me. I think about many movements, Occupy Wall Street, for example, and I wonder if they would have been more successful if they had a clearer, more focused agenda mm -hmm. and constructive 
solutions and engaged lawmakers and policymakers by, as we say, writing letters, starting petitions, working on legislation to make concrete change. Is it fair to say that many well-intentioned activists get caught up in the immediate passion and glory of demonstrations and then lose the energy for, as we said earlier, the tedious long-term work to effectuate lasting change? I think, yes. I mean, I think that's what we're seeing. And I don't really blame them simply because of this sort of social media thing that I was describing, that I think we have the emphasis on narrative, on telling a story has become uh, sort of as overwhelmed sort of all the other work that people need to do to bring about different sorts of realities. So Occupy Wall Street was in some ways sort of brilliant in terms of, of the, and so was Black Lives Matter for that matter, in terms of in setting forth a narrative, a narrative that that's a so, the social media helps refine, right? Because you're looking to go viral, right? So you're looking for the most emotionally impactful, quick, three-word way to express uh, something that is really going to punch people in the gut, right? So, um, you know, the, the concept of the 99% or Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, you know, a marketing genius couldn't come up with, <laughs> with those ideas, right? But the problem is, is that, you know, we have, we, we were so conditioned to look for the rewards of good narrative, to look for those thumbs up, those favorites, those likes, that, that and, and, and it's an important aspect of a movement. Look, you have to establish a narrative if you want to change the way people think about reality, but it's not enough. Um, and, and, oh. Yeah, the, yeah. It's, it has to go. And, and, you know, I so I have a chapter in the book on Black Lives Matter, and I spent a lot of time with activists working in uh, most of my research was like in Minneapolis and in Miami and Florida. And I looked at two groups very closely. And these were real sort of organizing on the ground people in many ways who bucked the sort of social media, you know, just, you know, sharing tweets and stuff. They actually were going door to door. They were looking about how to how to change, how to do police reform at a very, very local level. Yeah. And they became, you know, they actually, it's funny, you would think that in a moment like the summer of 2020, when the whole world is turning their attention to the issue of institutional racism and the things that they care about and they want us talking about around our dinner tables, they also felt very overwhelmed by those moments because they, they said, this is this sort of the triumph of narrative in some ways, but how do you how do you turn that in? How do you grab that energy and turn it into this question of we need to change the local city council? If we don't change the makeup of the city council, then we can't get the budget next year uh, to be reconfigured so that more money goes towards, say, social services and less towards the police department. Like, that's the problem, right? But <laughs> but if you're only focused on, like, this big story um, and you don't, you don't have mechanisms for using it, for translating it into, I mean, another way to think about it, I talk about this in the book, this came from one of the activists, is the notion of hard power and soft power. Mm -hmm. So soft power is the narrative stuff. It's the story that you tell. It's how you convince people of a different sort of worldview that you want to bring them along into. And hard power is the like real work of changing laws, of lobbying, of, of and you can sort of turn soft power into hard power but you need to sort of be attuned to the ways that the, of, of doing that and 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 the need to do that if you're just satisfied with yourself that like everybody is you know retweeting a million times black lives matter then you 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 it's it's you know it's it's just not enough it's i think what you said is really powerful and succinct and it's something that's really been on my mind and my friends minds for years we're like why is nothing everything is sort of glorious and and sort of sexy and exciting and dynamic and cinematic and you have these incredible narratives and then it just sort of you know, Peter's away and nothing really concrete ever comes of it. And I think you really just nailed it on the head with what you just said and also with what you write in your book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this research started with dissidents of the Soviet Union and Samizdat? Yeah. Pronounced that right, yeah. Which, which we'll also discuss further a bit later, but give us a little bit of an intro yeah. if you could. So I had I had just so my my first book was a was about this movement that existed for about 25 years. Uh, it involved getting allowing Jews to freely immigrate out of the Soviet Union. Even in the late part of the 20th century, the last you know 30, 40 years of the Cold War, they weren't really allowed to leave, and so they and and they were being massively persecuted inside the Soviet Union. And so this huge movement that actually had real implications in terms of human rights, also in the United States, and the role of human rights in foreign policy, um, took off. But what I was uh, part of the book looked 
very specifically at the dissidents in the Soviet Union, at the underground. And what I became fascinated with and sort of what I emerged from that book still interested in was Samizdat. Now, Samizdat literally means in, in Russian, it means self-published. And this was any writing that was not legally sanctioned, you know, because anything that was published at all, you know, there was no sort of independent small presses, like everything had to get the stamp of the state's approval. And so there was a whole world of, you know, writing uh, and thinking that could not really find its way into people's hands. So people went and produced on typewriters, they would use paper that was like onion skin paper, like very thin paper, produce them, you know, triplicate or four or five copies at a time, uh, stapled together, and then passed around hand to hand. And, you know, sometimes this was translations of uh, of Western uh, work that that wasn't allowed into, you know, like a book like 1984, for example, you know, it was like a Sami's dot bestseller, right? Um, but other times, and this is what I became really interested in, uh, the Sami's dot was actually used for writing that people would produce themselves. Um, some of which was about actually cataloging and sort of bearing witness to the reality that they were facing, the suppression they were facing. So um, I became very interested and it became a chapter in this book um, in something called the Chronicle of Current Events, which was this uh, almost like a pastiche of just like incidents that people were noticing and, re and not just small things, but sometimes they do whole research into various civil rights and human rights violations in the country. So say, you know, you're a teacher and the uh, teacher that you work with suddenly gets fired for teaching a banned book, you know? So you would, you would write this incident, what you had witnessed on a small piece of paper, crumple it up and somehow, and pass it on to the person who had given you a copy of the, the latest chronicle. They would pass it on to the person they knew, they knew, they knew. That chain would go all the way back to Moscow where there was an editor who would then put that incident in the next, in the next edition. It's almost like the precursor to social media on some level. It's sort of, yeah. you know, this well, idea you could really describe it as like as like Tor, you know, where it's like that you have this this like oh. a an anonymizing system where you only know the person who passes you the you know the magazine, you know, the journal, and then the person that you pass who you pass it to. Um and I yeah. I'm struck by how far reaching those yeah. messages were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can see because of the like where the news was coming from, it get, get further and further away. But so the point about Sami's dot that got me very interested was that it this became the glue of this kind of shadow civil society. They were living by a different set of ideals, values, and the Sami's dot, the actual communication medium, was the thing that held them together. That kind of gave them purpose, and and it seems so potent. And 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 also, you know, they they were the one of these values was. What we came to know as glasnost, which is transparency, right? right? Eventually, the regime itself took up this idea, you know. So, so this was definitely an incubation process where, like, they were holding tight to these other set of values and allowing them to continue to exist and sort of bubble up at the same time that the rest of society was sort of in this kind of double think totalitarian mode. Um, so, I got very excited about sort of what Sami's dot had to say about how communication works when you have these sort of radical ideas that are counter to a society at the same time that it was the Arab Spring, right? So Arab Spring happens in 2010, 11, and we all are so enamored with the idea that social media is this revolutionary medium that like, look, look here, they suddenly these people have social media and they can take down dictators, right? And you know what, that did happen to some extent, right? But the problem is, is that these same tools that were so useful in sort of bringing down regimes were at, were totally unhelpful in doing the thing that Samizdat did so well, which is sort of building over time a sense of solidarity, a sense of and a place to sort of to exchange ideas, to imagine, to like to to work towards new ends together. Uh, Gol, I want to do something with you that I don't usually do with most of my writers, and that is I want to take the viewer by hand and walk them through your entire book. And we don't have a lot of time. So if you can maybe give us like a one or two minute summary of each chapter, I'll set you up with each one and then you can kind of flesh it out a little bit. So we still have to buy the book, though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> buy the book. We're really just going to be scratching the surface. Um, <laughs> What happened in 1635 in Provence with Nicolas Claude Fabri de Pierrecq, yeah. of Europe's greatest minds, and his voluminous letter writing? Right. 
So in that chapter, I, I wanted to look at what's called the Republic of Letters, which was this network of um, you know men, mostly like you know learned men, clerics, clerks, um, you know aristocrats, who all around the same time, you know, coming out of the Renaissance, like began to sort of want to examine the natural world and like what made you know, with their own eyes, kind of come to sort of objective truths about the way the world works, the way, you know, basically science. They're coming upon right. the scientific method at the same time that the church still has sort of a stranglehold on truth. Like, you know, you couldn't really challenge, say, the, where the place of where the earth was in, in the universe. You know, that was that was the church's role to say that. So they began communicating by letters, these like networks of letters. And it wasn't, you know, it's not even just one-to-one -one communication. Like people would write a copy out letters that they'd gotten from somebody into like another letter. Like it really did have this sort of function as a, a network. And they were exchanging information about um, experiments they were doing, about observations that they were having, you know, um, in the realms of geology, astronomy, you know, everything was sort of suddenly open to question. And this was subversive activity. I mean, it was, you know, their Galileo who was sort of a dipped his toe in, in the Republic of Letters, but was more interested in sort of writing books. He got in trouble. Like he, he got in trouble with the authorities and, and was placed in house arrest for the rest of his life. But these guys wanted to do things in a more sort of, um, in a more, uh, in, they were interested in process and in, in sort of slowly building knowledge and letters were important. That particular chapter focuses on a, on a kind of a crowdsource, we would call it today, experiment that one guy, he's the center of the chapter, the, one of the hubs of the Republic of Letters named Peresque, um, right. he decides to, to, to understand, to, he wants to get a better idea of what the correct size of the Mediterranean Sea is because he has a sense that it's wrong on all the maps, all the officially sanctioned maps. And so he organizes a group eclipse throughout the, the known world. They are all going to watch one, an eclipse on one night. And, and if they everyone records the time they saw the eclipse, then using that, they can actually figure out longitude. So they can figure out the correct size of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, yeah. 1500 with science. And that's, that's, right. that's what's so exciting about your book, too, is that you you, you move from sort of social movements to political movements to scientific movements to intellectual movements, and it, it all starts uh, in the 1600s. And these are all very human-centric stories. When right. you speak about narrative, it's, it's almost sort of like a meta thing that you're doing, you know, looking at narrative uh, of the ideas themselves. 1839, Manchester, Fergus O'Connor, the yeah. charterist movement. Right. Edition, science, laborer and class conditions. Yeah, so this was, um, you know, England in the 1830s has an idea of itself as being a democracy, you know, going back to the Magna Carta, but in reality, a very only small sliver of, of men are allowed to have the right to vote. You have to have loan land, all, there's all kinds of other conditions. At the same time, industrialization is happening. The condition of working people is getting worse and worse and worse, very, you know, just miserable, but they have zero recourse. They have no uh, representation. They have no right to vote. Um, so Fergus O'Connor and a few others uh, begin, they take advantage of what's basically a loophole in British law, which is that everyone has the right to petition. You have the right to petition parliament, right to petition the king. Uh, but nobody's ever used this at a kind of revolutionary scale. It's only been like for small land disputes, things like that. But they get the idea to create a, a petition that is basically asking for the right to vote. Um, uh, they call it the National Charter. And and this petition uh, sort of makes its way around the country and the process of collecting signatures because they decide they want it to be what they call a monster petition um, is, is actually what sort of welds together uh, uh, this new constituency, this idea of a working class, a working class that should have the right to vote and to, and to speak up for its own interests. So that chapter was fascinating because here you have another medium, a petition. It's not a petition, you know, it's not like what we think of today where you just kind of click on something, but they actually, these people had to put in enormous hard work, door to door, sneaking onto factory floors, setting up in marketplaces. You know, every act of getting somebody to sign is this kind of intimate moment of convincing somebody um, that they should kind of become part of this constituency, take a risk in many respects. Um, 
but it, but out of that act, out of that intimate act, you know, of sign, then coming and signing your name, grew out this entire movement. They managed that first petition. They got 1.3 million signatures. They were, which is incredible, right? In 1839, they were laughed out of parliament, you know, um, but but that was, but the, the first step was already taken. And the first step being, they thought of themselves as being a working class. And so from there, it was another like 30 years till they got the right to vote. But, you know, this was a way that they kind of made themselves, I think the way I say it in the chapter is they made themselves legible, you know, like they, they yeah. It, it was surprisingly very moving. Yeah. That chapter was surprisingly. No, no, it was for me as well. <laughs> in the plight of effort. The next chapter is something that intrigues me tremendously. Uh, in 1913 in Florence with Filippo Tommaso Marinetti and the Futurists. I've always been fascinated by the Futurists and Futurism. Could we say that it inspired fascism and Nazism? I mean, is that a fair thing to say? I mean, certainly certainly, fascism in, in Italy was a direct offshoot of the Futurists. I mean, they by the end of that chapter, you see that Marinetti, who's sort of their leader, joins forces with Mussolini and, you know, um, and from the very beginning, the, the futurists who were these sort of like angry young men um, who, who, you know, who... It reminds me of, I'm getting into trouble for saying this, but the angry young men who were hewing to Trump. Yeah, you know. no, I say, that in the, I say that in the chapter. Um, these were angry young men who, who sort of began to sort of imagine kind of outrageous things, you know, like that they would like raise old Italian cities. They wanted to build m huge modernist gleaming structures. This was sort of an art movement at first, um, although there was always sort of a political edge to it. Uh, I wanted through that chapter because I wanted, you know, I, I, I talk in this book about radical ideas, but I didn't want to sort of give the impression that I'm only thinking of the progressive ones that I have an affinity for, but that you know, radicalism of any sort is just the notion of like challenging reality's precepts. And so here's an example of people who had this sort of where I find it, and you know, just like later in the book, I look at Charlottesville and white supremacists. Here's an example of people who had pretty abhorrent, violent visions, you know, of um, and, you know, with an extreme sort of misogyny, you know, where they talk about, you know, killing women and and raising cities and and wanting war you know um that was really their 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 big thing they wanted war to sort of cleanse the italian identity but there the, the medium was manifestos right and so we think of manifestos as this sort of one to many medium you know where it's your writing how you're going to change the world but in fact what i found when i looked into it was that first of all these were mostly group written Right, so they were. It was the it was the result of people coming together and sort of putting bringing their ideas together. Most of them had many authors, and also there were like hundreds of them. Like in this period of time, that futurism was sort of at its height from like 1913 to 1919. There was you know they were constantly writing these manifestos about all different kinds of things, and and I began to see that there was a kind of iterative process to them where it, they were in conversation with each other and each was pushing one another. So they were performative in many ways. But they all and they would literally go and sort of read these out and people would throw vegetables at them and stuff. And, um, but they but they also served this purpose of um, giving that chapter is called imagination. And we could talk about the titles I give these chapters because I'm looking in each one to sort of draw out what the quality is of that communications medium, like what it's actually doing. And in this case, it's giving them a space to imagine. And the things they're imagining are ridiculous. I mean, at first glance, just like, you know, would be ridiculous. Some of the things that white supremacists are imagining about the future they want seem ridiculous. Sure. Things that, you know, mm -hmm. um, but, 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 it, but it's that moment of being a, a given a space to even consider the ridiculous where you begin to enter it into the world, you know? Um, and that can be said on both sides of the political spectrum, right? Yeah. The first chapter, we should say, is patience. The second was coherence. This third one is imagination. The next one, chapter four, is debate. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, 1935 Accra with J.B. Dancois and the first African-owned daily newspaper, The Times of Africa. And then Namdi Azakiwe with mm -hmm. his newspaper, African Morning Post. Can right. you tell us about chapter four? Yeah, so that, this is a, you know, and, and this will give you a sense of my process a little bit about how I found these stories. You know, in, in some cases, 
you know, like the Peresque, the chapter in the in the 17th century, that was like literally a footnote in some other book where it talked oh, about wow. this guy organizing a mass viewing of an eclipse. And I was like, that's interesting. And I sort of began to dig. In this okay. case, I, I did like, it was like more of a sense of reverse engineering, which is that, you know, I knew that there was this uh, momentous, thing that happened in Africa, you know, in the mid 20th century, which is they threw off the, you know, colonialist yoke. Uh, there were these great uh, independence movements. Um, but I, I started thinking like, you know, from a communications perspective, you know, like if we brought, if we rewind it back to like the earliest moments of people beginning to sort of consider what it would be to have a national identity that was separated from their identity as subjects of, of, of the British in this case. Um, like, where are they working out those ideas? Where are they like sort of beginning to sort of argue with each other towards this new national identity? Because to be, a, there was nothing like a Ghanaian, you know, before colonialism existed. There were, you know, many, many different tribes, you know, each with their own allegiances, their practices, their, so how do they become a nation? Uh, and it's sort of what has to happen for them to really grab independence away, you know, for themselves. So I, I discovered that there were these newspapers, these African-owned newspapers. There were a few of them and there was a small readership, but the readership, because there were not very many people who were literate at, the, at that time in the 1930s, um, but there were an increasing number of people who were, and they would take to these newspapers. Um, and the, sorry, I should say the newspapers did not look like papers that we read today, like Western right. newspapers filled with, you know, reports from professional journalists to go out and gather information. They were mostly kind of like what the op-ed pages or the opinion pages looked like almost entirely. And they didn't have a lot of capital to operate these papers either, we should say, no, right? These no, are no, they were, and, and which is partly why, you know, there's no budget for reporters. You fill your pages with people's free opinion that they're sending in. So people would write anonymously and pseudonymously. They, there was the biggest feature in this one paper, the West African uh, Morning Times was, was uh, called Grumbler's Row. You know, <laughs> people would come to grumble about any number of things, about what it meant to be under British rule. Um, but most interestingly for me, as they start arguing with each other about their future, and what their future is going to look like, um, and you know things like when we're in when we're a nation, are we going to be monogamous or polygamous? You know, it sounds like a funny question, but it actually goes to the heart of like where do we draw the line between our sort of traditional identity and our tribal identities and this sort of new Ghanaian identity that we might take on? You know, and and so all of that needed to be worked out. It's its own kind of incubation. Sure. And, and it was it was such an education for me because I, I didn't know much about this particular aspect um, in African history. Um, the next chapter we spoke about a bit, yeah. uh, Sami's died in 1968 in Moscow with Natalia and Natasha Korben, Korbenevskaya. Korbenevskaya. <laughs> I'm butchering it. Um, I, I'd like to just move a little bit beyond that if we could, because there's, there's so many others I want to touch upon. 1992, Washington. Now, suddenly we're in the 90s. Right. Val and her zine Jigsaw. Of course, Toby would end up joining Kathleen Hanna and creating the well-known band Bikini Kill, which right. was so, that kind of came at me from nowhere. I was like, wow, this is incredible. His mind is so elastic that you <laughs> suddenly bring this in. Um, talk to us briefly about this chapter, which is titled, um, oh God, Control. Control. Control, yeah. No, you had me for a moment, not remembering. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, that was, I should say, that was the fun of this book, was sort of like, what would it be like to get, have all these stories sort of like rub against each other? And like, what kind of interesting thoughts would emerge from that friction? So um, in this chapter, I'm writing about zines, mm -hmm. which I assume that maybe our reader, our, our audience knows. Um, <laughs> these kind of, you know, a form of Sami's Dot in a way, sort of stapled together homemade magazines uh, with glue, made with glue sticks and Xerox copiers. Um, and zines emerged from this desire among, you know, the zines that I'm looking at. Uh, I mean, zines had this long history of sort of people who had kind of, who were sort of science fiction nerds, like who had sort of genre interests that weren't reflected in the wider culture. They would create their own, Sort of magazines mm -hmm. um, to connect with each other too, because people would share these and sort of swap them. And but but eventually, these like young women, young women began to sort of glom onto this medium as a way to express all the things that they just weren't seeing in the mainstream, you know, magazines and 
press at the time, um, which were their concerns, you know, concerns about, um, you know, sexual harassment, concerns about body image or, you know, the way that women were being represented in, in the media, like, um, or, or really deep sort of, you know, a lot of them were teenagers, you know, the issues of, of worrying about rape, wanting to talk about abortion, you know, wanting to talk about the issues that kind of went to the heart of, of their real concerns um, and um, eating disorders, you know, a whole, a whole range of different things that became sort of the topics of conversation. And they created their own magazines, these zines, to do that. And each of them were were kind of interesting in that they were very memoir, very kind of memoir oriented. And then it's somebody's personal voice, their personal stories, but yet by committing them in this form of a zine, you sort of form, you, you become part of this network of other people doing that. So, so it was both personal, but it was also collective, um, which actually is very much sort of what third wave feminism is kind of about. It's about sort of the individual experience of, of trauma, of being a woman, you know, in different realms of society sort of be becomes the foundation of a certain kind of politics. Sure. And independent of that, in, in literature, we're seeing such an explosion of memoirs across the board from so many different uh, identities and especially people at the margins. Um, moving into very recent history, what happened in Cairo in 2011 with the Arab Spring and the image of the murdered computer programmer Khaled Saeed and the Facebook page called We Are All Khaled created by Wael Gonim? Gonim, yeah. And then this movement was, of course, amplified by the self-immolation of uh, Mohammed Bouzazi in Tunisia. Mm -hmm. So that was, I mean, the, now we're getting into sort of the social media realm. That's sort of where the book splits in two. And, and, I, and that chapter very much is sort of a, a cautionary tale. Um, it's, the, the most, most, yeah. it's the most sort of cautionary tale of the chapters that I, that I look at. And that, you know, social media, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but social media for this group of sort of suddenly, that suddenly found themselves as revolutionaries. Um, you know, they, they, at first they were just sort of responding to police brutality. As you described, there was a, there was this image of a man who'd been extrajudicially killed by the police. Um, and it, it, people responded to it in the way people responded to say Emmett Till's, you know, face, um, the image of his face. And so, um, but they had Facebook and they started to organize on Facebook and this led to real world protests. And then before they knew it, there was, hundreds of thousands of people like in the square in, in, in Tahrir in the middle of Cairo. And it was extremely effective, that tool, that social media tool as a sort of bullhorn, bringing everybody out to the streets. Um, and it brought down their physical presence there, brought down their dictator, Mubarak. But, what, but the problem and the reason it's a cautionary tale is that the day after that happened, when they needed to sort of turn themselves into a political opposition, this sort of strange coalition that had come together. There were Islamists, there were Marxists. It was, it was a whole range of people who had one objective, which was to, to end the dictatorship, but to go from there into a place where they could contend for power, where they could become a political opposition. They needed not a tool like Facebook, which just sort of forced them into these purity spirals of, you know, I'm more committed to the revolution than you, tearing each other down. You know, not, they didn't have a space where they could do the work that Sami's dot provided or that the petitions provided or the letters provided where they, this kind of deliberative space where they could work towards common objectives, figure out their organizational structure. And they were crushed. I mean, utterly crushed. Yeah. Um, and, and then the people who, even the people who were most excited about social media at that revolutionary moment, they are the ones who told me how critical they became of it as a medium, you know, that it didn't allow them what they needed in that moment. And then we move into chapter eight, which is Charlottesville in 2017 with Richard Spencer and his alt-right publications like alternativeright.com and the Think Tank National Policy Institute. And to me, this was sort of like a modern day version of chapter three with the futurists where you're looking now at, you know, radicals on the other side. Right. Talk to us a little bit about- I mean, the work that that chapter did too is that, you know, I, I you know, because those folks were pushed off of the major platforms. They needed to find their own quiet space where they could communicate with each other, right? So I managed to get access to, um, to, to 
they, 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 they use something called Discord, which is a, an app that maybe people are familiar with, um, you know, invented for gamers so they could sort of talk to each other. And you create on Discord these servers, which are, I mean, people might know this, but I, it was news to me at the time, but people, you create these servers that are sort of private chat rooms, essentially, and you decide who allow, who gets let in and there's a moderator. And most importantly, these aren't like performative spaces in the way like a Twitter or Facebook is. They, you, there's no like button, there's no upvoting. You're basically, um, your incentive, you know, if there's an incentive structure to it, is to keep the conversation going. You know, you want to say, hey, Brian, that's an interesting idea. What do you think about this? Or, um, you know, I don't agree with you. Like, it, it actually lends itself to, to conversation in a space where people feel like they're, they're not going to be shamed for what they're saying necessarily. I know it's also hot among people who buy and sell NFTs now as well, right? Yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah. Then we have, of course, the virus, the coronavirus. Mm -hmm about the coronavirus, um, New York City 2020, Ava Lee, who maybe a lot of people don't know, and Fred sure <laughs> Dawn, can you tell us just briefly, I mean, we know so much of the story about the coronavirus right now, but right, I think right. Ava Lee and the Red Dawn might be an aspect of this gigantic, very current story that maybe we don't know so much about. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to look at, you know, I was aware that there were these small networks of epidemiologists. Um, she was one of the, you know, she, she, she was actually more of like a statistician, but she was working on, 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 on virology. You know, people who were real ex scientific experts who felt edged out of, of decision making in that moment, um, because so much of it became a political, as we well know, a political question of just like trying to pretend like, this wasn't actually a problem <laughs> for a long time in the beginning. Um, and, and they knew that it was because they were approaching it purely as scientists, you know? So, um, so I discovered that there was this group that this email chain of people who were, you know, incubating, you know, in, in a kind of a dissident way, um, their own set of rules, you know, for what they would do if they were in charge. Um, and some of these ideas sort of trickled out and, you know, really help people at local levels, uh, local public health officials sort of understand what they should do, really nitty gritty stuff, you know, like how many people should sit around a table in a restaurant, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and so, yeah, Ava Lee was a, was a kind of a, 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 an entry into that, into that world. Yeah. It, was, it was great. It was a really great insight. Um, I want to let our viewers know that we'll be taking questions for Gaul shortly, so please start sending them in by writing them in the chat box. While we wait for those to come in, Gaul, I'd like to ask you about the final chapter, Chapter 10, The Names, Minneapolis 2020. Uh, we all know at this point too well what happened in Minneapolis in 2020 with the recording and streaming of the murder of George Floyd. Uh, please tell us about someone maybe we don't know so much about, Miski Noor, and, and they are Black Visions Collective. Right. So, I, you know, Black Lives Matter offer, offered me sort of an interesting opportunity because I, I had seen, you know, it's, it's a movement now that's been around for, for a decade. Mm -hmm. And when you begin to talk to the activists who are really, you know, doing the hard work of organizing on behalf of these issues, um, they have seen um, a real sort of evolution in their thinking about how to deal with these moments of extreme visibility and attention, you know, when they come. Uh, and 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 because they are challenging to them, because they they are this opportunity in many ways. They're a chance to sort of uh, grab onto that power and 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 direct it in ways that could be productive for them um, towards making real change. But they could also sort of sweep over them and sweep everything away too, um, or make people feel like there are symbolic victories that have been won, um, but that don't actually change the reality on, on the ground. So, so I, I got to know a, a few of these folks, including Miski, you know, who were, who were working at, to, to sort of make that happen, to actually take the energy of those moments and turn them into, into change. And what you begin to understand is they're drawing on the same tools that like the petitioners in the 1830s are drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, is, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, literally like once they turned off, you know, one of these groups did what they called a blackout, which is they actually, just turned off, deleted their apps for three months. It was a fascinating experiment. And they started going out into their neighborhoods and really talking to the people who they, you know, thought of themselves as representing. And among other things that they learned is people didn't want to get rid of the police. People didn't want to abolish the police the way they thought, that, the way they wanted to, these activists. And so then it became a conversation, you know, of, um, you know, well, are you happy with the police? Well, no, not really. Well, then, like, what 
how can we arrive at some kind of set of solutions that might improve the situation? And that's a, like an entirely like just a much more nuanced process that takes time where you have to create the forums for people to share ideas. And, and then you have to like turn those ideas into concrete policy and get people elected who are going to sort of be able to, to shift money uh, in, 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 in serious ways from certain parts of the city budget to others. You know, it's, they, they really, there really was sort of a learning curve and, 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 you know, in many ways it's sort of an ideal situation because there are these moments where a lot of energy rushes in and you're beginning to have this increasing cadre of people who understand sort of what to do with it. Okay. We got a few questions coming in from our viewers. Would you like to address the fragmented state of news media and the competition to define and defend alternative truths? Where do you think we will be five years from now as a nation at the rate we are going? Um, I mean, it's not it's not entirely my subject, but I but I but I I mean I I take the point you know that like we're we're all sort of already living in these like you know bubbles of our, you know the of in terms of information and what our notions of truth are. So I guess I mean I'm imagining that the critique could be a my work even, you know, why, why are you asking people to sort of step away even further into these secluded corners, you know? Um, and, and the truth is, is like, I, I think that it has to be sort of a dual process. I think that that fragmentation is not a good thing, you know, for certainly not for American democracy, uh, but we have to understand this in a much more dynamic way, which is that people need to have an opportunity to talk amongst themselves, um, to, to create ideas, to imagine amongst themselves, certainly to do things, to, to speak in ways that they won't feel shamed for speaking, you know? Yes. Um, I mean, you know, we, we, you know, the, 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 there's, you know, we talk about safe spaces sometimes in a sort of a derogatory way, or certain people talk about a derogatory way, but I think in some ways we need to reclaim that idea a little bit, that there is, there is, there is, there is uh, an importance in seclusion, you know, in privacy. Um, and, and that's not, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're closed to what uh, other people think or that you're not willing to be challenged by other points of view. But first you need a space where you can actually refine your own point of view. Um, and, and I guess that's the sort of intervention that I'm, that I'm trying to make with this quote. To be able to make, like, speak your mind freely, even if the ideas are unpopular without fear of like being canceled. Is yeah. that, is that yeah. fair? So the next question is kind of long. I'm going to try to synthesize it. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on movements where the main focus is on building dual power rather than on changing laws or policies in the existing system. I think Occupy Wall Street's goal was to get people to start moving in that direction, even though I don't think they articulated that very well. Um, I'm currently involved in a movement to build a mutual aid based commun communalist network to eventually challenge, compete with and overtake the existing system by drawing away participation in the existing system and add uh, into the new one. Um, this would be a new system of directly democratic consensus based decision making self governing communities akin to that which is currently being implemented in the Kurdish region of Rojava, of course, changing laws in the existence in the existing system. Um, might serve to make building dual power more feasible, but it is not the ultimate goal of the movement. The goal is to replace the existing system with a new one. It's, it's a thoughtful um, idea. It's, it's a lot to digest. I know. Yeah, no. I mean, I think what I what I'll take from that <laughs> is, is is the idea of you know building that sometimes uh, you know to, to to get social movements started or to make change to speak kind of in broad terms you need to actually have like a, a different you need to sort of uh live out the, the the truth that you're trying to to bring into the world sure, you know you need sure. to actually create and, and that's why i think occupy there was like there was sort of interesting things that were happening sort of on the ground right in terms of the culture that was being created uh there um it's similar in tahrir square there were there was there was there was sort of people talk about it as almost these like, utopian sort of environments where people were beginning to treat each other differently to act differently and so i think you know part of this idea of, of creating a separate space or a quieter space that's not just worried about these high impact moments of protest but actually is um concerned with how people live together uh and sort of live it like i said living out you know the realities that you want to to actually manifest um that, that's a really important component uh, in any kind of activism so many different iterations of sustainability, maybe, right? Right, right. Um, 
I have two. I have two more questions from from for myself. What new movements do you see taking shape now? Um, I mean, I think there's. It's you know, it's hard, especially with a book like this that's looking at like a long trajectory of change. You know, because <laughs> you don't know sort of where in the story you're you're at. Um, I think that there seems to be a lot of really interesting work being done around climate change. Um, you know, at the, the recent conference in, in in Glasgow, you know, there was there were. Uh, I mean, I heard just kind of anecdotally fascinating stories of groups of young people, especially sort of coming together in interesting ways. And, you know, for my own purposes, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, cu curious from my own, from my own perspective, understanding that social media was not the place to do this, but, you know, gathering in like group homes and like, and having conversate communal conversations that way, where they're planning, where they're sharing information from their different communities. Uh, so I think there's, positive things happening there. There's a lot of movements that I would love to see started. I just, I, you know, they, they, I just, you know, I felt like I had an opportunity, sadly, you know, recently with the school shooting in Valde to, to sort of begin to imagine like what, what movement could emerge from this, you know, that would, that would take, they, and I, I wrote a piece um, because I wanted to sort of understand what lessons the work that I had done in this book could possibly, how they could possibly apply to this moment. Um, and the conclusion I came to was, well, two things. First, I felt that a certain amount of time needed to be baked into any sort of uh, action. Uh, sure. So I, so I suggested we should take the summer. Right. And then, and then, you know, looking at sort of what's been effective in the past, I thought, well, students should just refuse to go back to school in, yeah. in the fall, that there should be like a national strike because it actually is, a form of real leverage. It's not just narrative. It actually is, you know, we know how disruptive that is, you know, when that doesn't happen, when kids don't go to school. I thought I, I thought I saw something happening in 2017, 2018 with Parkland. And yes, all well, they, well, they began to do like walkouts, but they were yeah. a little bit like symbolic in their in their in their form, you know, it was like let's walk out for the, a certain number of minutes. And and even that really riled up, for, you know. You know the, the the principals in these schools and you know local uh, superintendents, people. You know, and to me that was an indication that this actually is a powerful tool. Oh yes, yeah. gets people upset. I was teaching uh, English at a charter school in the South Bronx during that period, and we had two walkouts. And I was so excited and proud of of the students for organizing that. I, I marched with them at the risk of yeah. being fired, but I didn't. Um, what are you working on next? Oh man, um, I there's not really a I mean there's 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 a few different ideas, but there's not a, a defined uh, book project quite yet. Um, okay. at, least, at least not one that I can talk about. Um, but I these days I'm quite busy sort of getting up and running this new book section at the Atlantic, which I'm excited about because um, um, you know we always we need a place for for ideas uh, <laughs> to sort of to share and to engage with new ideas, and and part of the sort of framework for the types of pieces that I'm doing is that they're always very much driven by, um, by, by, you know, by new notions that people want to bring in. Yeah. Will this be exclusively like nonfiction or fiction and nonfiction? It's a range. It's a both fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Very exciting. Good work. Gall, thank you so much for this. It's really been a well, pleasure. Thank you. thank you. No, it was, it was fun to be here virtually to be in Queens in any case. <laughs> yes, virtually. The book, again, is The Quiet Before on the Unexpected Origins of Radical Ideas. Gold Beckerman is the author. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a safe weekend. Take care. Be well. Thank you.